Well, good evening, everybody, and welcome to Dome at Home, the April edition. We're at the end of March. We're in spring break. We have the Easter weekend coming up. Um, I'm off for four whole days in a row. I'm looking forward to that. And we will be taking a look at everything that's up in the sky and happening over the next month or so. And of course, um, unless you have not been watching any media at all in the last little while, you know the big solar eclipse is the thing that's coming up. People are counting down by the day. And um, it's definitely one of those things that's happening. But there are lots of other things happening as well. And so we're going to get into a bunch of that stuff. There's been some cool space stuff over the last month and all of that as well. And uh, I'm glad to say that uh, people have been starting to send in some pictures and things like that as well, which has been really nice to see all the stuff that other people are doing astronomy-wise. I've had the chance to get outside under the sky a few times in March. Um, it's a pretty busy week for us at the museum and the planetarium. Um, spring break is our busiest week of the year. So if you just happen to be, you know, thinking, oh, let's go down to the museum or, or whatever, um, it's a busy time right now. There's, uh, you probably want to get your tickets in advance so you don't have to stand in line. Go to the website and, and they'll uh, hook you up that way. But um, it means that we open new programs. It means that we have lots and lots of people coming through the doors. And so it's been kind of a busy week, or a busy month, pardon me. But I have got out under the skies a couple of times, including once out under the skies of Churchill. We, I had the opportunity to go up with someone from the museum. Uh, our CEO and I went up to uh, Churchill, Manitoba for a whirlwind 31-hour trip. That's including flight time. And uh, we spent one night there, and they packed it in, in terms of uh, the things that we got to experience. We went dog sledding right from the airport. We didn't even go to the hotel. We went dog sledding. And then we got on the tundra buggies and went out to a, a tundra buggy restaurant and ate out there. But then waited for it to get dark, and it was cloudy. So we sat inside the tundra buggy and chatted with all the people that were there and patiently waited for things to, to clear up, and they did. And I got a chance to see, I think, the best northern lights of my life. Now, I'm no northern lights neophyte. I've seen the northern lights many times. Back in the 80s when I was doing my astronomy degree, the northern lights were so bright and so continuous that I actually had problems doing a, other kinds of astronomy because the northern lights would cover the whole sky and you literally could not see the galaxies or the planets or the stars that you were trying to look at with the telescope. So I won't say I got sick of them, but I certainly wished for the occasional aurora-free night uh, while I was doing my, uh, my astronomy projects. Anyway, it was glorious. It's, uh, it's a bit of a trek to get up there. Uh, the flight's not too bad. Um, the train is running now, but it's, uh, it's a long trip. Uh, so that's part of the experience as well. And the thing about Churchill, it's a town of 1,900 people or so. It doesn't have unlimited numbers of hotels and restaurants and things like that. So they pretty much only have a certain capacity each year. So if you have the opportunity to head to Churchill or even to Thompson, um, Lynn Lake, Flin Flon, anywhere farther north from here. Go during the dark of the moon. Go when the skies get dark, so don't go midsummer. Excuse me. And you will be able to hopefully get a great view of the Northern Lights. It's just beautiful because you're so much closer to the action that there's always something going on, whether it's sort of like a, a 5 out of 10 aurora or a 10 out of 10 aurora. There's always something going on there. Whereas here in in southern Manitoba, even just a, a few hundred kilometers farther south, we really can have nights where there is nothing going on. Even if the sun is active, it just doesn't reach far enough down for us to see. So my, my trip north was wonderful, and I can't wait to go again. It's great to see so many folks uh, checking in on the chat. Please do say hello, and um, so that way we know, you know, who's out there, who's watching, how you're all doing. Um, let's see. Oh, hi, Tiffany. Oh, Ulrike is here. It looks like a beautiful evening. Yeah, we're going to get some clear skies tonight. Of course, I have a show to do, so I can't be getting the telescope ready, but that's okay. I'll go out afterwards. Hi, Tara and Jacqueline. Um, oh, from Northwestern Ontario. I'm not sure exactly whereabouts you are, but if you're, are you close enough that you're going to be driving to the eclipse path? Um, I guess it depends. Northwestern Ontario is a big place, so could be anywhere in there, I guess. But uh, definitely try and make that if you can. Neil and Janet, S Stan, nice to see you. Tiffany, digging the blue shirt. Yeah, I, 
I've gotten a little better with the technology. I can now use a green screen and a blue shirt. For the longest time, I had to wear something that wasn't blue or green because I would become just a disembodied head floating on the screen and the shirt would disappear. So now I've got it figured out. Oh, Phil and Fallon, nice to see you. Um, and uh, oh, the, wow, there are just so many folks checking in. Amy, nice to see you. Um, let's see, Phil, you saw them at Paint Lake. Oh yeah, that's a nice dark location. And when you see the Northern Lights from a dark location, it really is mind blowing. You know, we're talking about the solar eclipse and, and you know, a total solar eclipse is one of the most amazing sights in nature. But let's face it, they're challenging to see. You know, I've seen two of them in my life. One of them, I was lucky enough that I lived in the path of totality when I was a kid. And then in 2017, I took the family down to Nebraska to see the eclipse. It was wonderful. It was mind blowing, but it took a lot of effort. When I was up in Churchill, I saw the Northern Lights in a way that I had never seen them before. The brightness level, the color that you could see with the unaided eye, the, the motion and the dancing, the activity, because the solar activity is peaking, we're, we're, we're gonna be in for great shows for the next year or so. This might be heresy to some people, but I think that that was as cool as seeing a total solar eclipse. And I have to say it was a whole lot easier because they, get, they had four nights of that kind of, a, um, of activity before I got there and they had three more nights afterwards. So that's a lot of, uh, it's a lot more than two or three minutes every 30 years or so. So anyway, check out the Northern Lights if you get the chance uh, and from a dark location. We'll, we'll have to do a show just on the Northern Lights as things get up after we get past the eclipse, I think, because uh, yeah, there's, there's just so much going on with the eclipse. Okay, um, let's see. Uh, I'm just gonna make sure that everything is active here and we are tracking everything we need to do. There we go. Great. All right. We're going to start off with some of our uh, viewer images from you because it's always nice to see what folks are doing looking at the sky. And so we're going to start off with some of the images that were sent to me at space at manitobamuseum.ca over the last month or so. Here's a shot by uh, regular contributor Ulrika. She had uh, an amazing view of the moon and Jupiter back um, I guess a, a couple of weeks ago it was when the moon was still a nice crescent. You can really see not only the bright part of the moon, but the, the earth shine. The dark side of the moon is visible for a couple of days or so right around this phase. It's actually not light hitting the moon from the sun. It's light that's hitting the earth. And the earth is mostly covered with clouds and water, which is pretty shiny. So the earth reflects some of that light back out and that lights up the dark side of the moon just a little bit. It's only really visible for a, a one or two nights each month because you have to get the right balance of the crescent not being too large and too bright to, to overwhelm the earth shine. And you also have to have it high enough in the sky that the moon is actually visible against a reasonably dark sky so that you can see it. So it's really, you, know, you have to be, um, you know, either lucky or persistent to catch it. So great shot. And of course, having Jupiter right next to it, I did glimpse this through the clouds uh, from where I was on that night. And I remember thinking, oh, I wish I had a camera here. I hope somebody takes a picture of it and sends it in. So thank you very much, Ulrika. Uh, we also got some shots from, uh, from Andy and Ruby. Uh, why are we not advancing our slide here? There we go. Um, Andy was out on the 23rd and taking shots of uh, Jupiter, which is the upper left object there, uh, right up there. And also the planet Mercury, which was down here. It was really only visible, you know, if you really went looking for it. And again, you have to catch it at just the right time between it's high enough in the sky to see, but the sky has gotten dark enough for you to see it. And so it's, it's quite a challenge to track down. Great, uh, great shot of this, but he actually picked up a third object that he wasn't expecting. And um, he sent in a sequence here because, uh, you know, a shot just a few seconds later, that third object showed up here. That's the International Space Station just happened to be rising up right past Mercury while this was, uh, while this was going on. So that's a great uh, shot with a little bit of luck and, uh, and again, a lot of persistence for being out there. Thanks a lot, Andy and Ruby. Good to hear from you and uh, hope you're doing well. And thanks for sending in those shots. Okay, um, let's see. We have some great uh, events coming up, um, but I wanted to go, go to um, 
something that happened, I guess, on the 23rd, actually. Uh, the local astronomy club, the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada, um, held a, a, a telescope tune-up for its members. In the springtime, you know, a lot of people hibernate over the winter. They put all their gear away, and they wait until springtime to sort of haul it out and clean it off and get it all ready for the, the coming observing season. Not everybody sort of observes all winter long, and I, I totally understand that idea. So we had this this event and a lot of people brought their telescopes out and and it happened to be clear so we had our te our solar telescopes out and uh, a friend of mine wing kuang who's a member of the uh, of the astronomical society took this great or had this great solar telescope set up and i just held my cell phone up to it and i was able to capture that big sunspot group that everyone was talking about over the last week the one that was causing all of the uh, the solar flares and some more little sunspots they look white here because this is a special kind of telescope that looks at what's called the chromosphere, the, the red outer layer of the sun that we normally don't see. But the cool thing are all these prominences. These are basically solar flares that are aimed away from us and we see them silhouetted on the edge of the sun. And they were just massive. And they were on both ends here. And there are a couple of other smaller ones. This photograph, because it, it, it's literally my iPhone held up to the eyepiece with hardly any prep. It's not a great picture. And yet it all, it captured so much. So I was, uh, I wanted to show sort of how easy it is nowadays to get some pictures. You don't even need your own telescope. So bring me, bring your cell phone along to the uh, eclipse event on uh, April 8th. And you can look through these telescopes. Even if the eclipse didn't happen, there'd still be cool stuff to look at. Um, I then looked through uh, another telescope that was showing the sort of more conventional uh, view. This is like the view you would get through your, your um, telescope filter or your eclipse glasses or things like that, the, the, the white light view. Um, and it shows the, the visible surface of the sun, the photosphere, and then all those dark sunspots. And there's that massive sunspot group that uh, was visible. It's, it's actually rotated. It's almost going off the edge of the sun today. Um, and so it's, it's, uh, the sun rotates roughly once a month. And so it's sort of moved on. But this kind of activity, this is pretty active, this bodes well for our views during the eclipse. I'm sure there'll be some nice sunspots to, uh, to view there. Okay, so let us move on to looking ahead at the coming month. Um, oh, please, um, if you have pictures that you'd like to send us, or you would like to um, send us a drawing or artwork that you've done, or anything else astronomical. Send me a, a story of something that you saw or a poem inspired by the sky, whatever you want. Um, you can always reach us through the Manitoba Museum um, and my email direct to my desk is space at manitobamuseum.ca. So we love to get this stuff. I'd love to put it on the show and share it with, uh, with everybody else. I think it's inspiring to see other people doing things. It pushes you to tr maybe try those things yourself. Okay. The great thing about the universe is that most of the time it's predictable. And so what we can do is we can use our wonderful programs like Stellarium, one of our favorite um, astronomy programs, to figure out what's going to be happening in the sky over the next little while. So I'm just going to change our time to a more appropriate evening time. This is the sky right now and it's not dark yet, so you really can't see very much. I have the constellations up there, but of course, they're not really visible. So, um, and let me just, hmm, we seem to have a weird reversal here. Let's fix that. There we go. After it gets dark, oh yeah, and this is still set for my backyard. Let's take away all the trees and things like that, because those are far too annoying to actually have to deal with on a regular basis, trust me. And it seems that our Stellarium window has been resized, so I'm just going to move that back to sort of a reasonable size here so that we can see properly. Not sure what happened there. That's okay. There we go. So this is the sky tonight, about 9 o'clock, and it's pretty much the evening sky for the next month or so. The Big Dipper is coming into prominence we can basically see it high up in the sky uh, in the northeast in the early evening, almost overhead around midnight, and then it's 
you know, by the morning sky, it's starting to go down in the northwest, but it's up above the buildings and the trees and things like that. This is the time to easily see the Big Dipper no matter where you live. The two stars in the bowl of the Big Dipper always point down to the North Star, which remains stationary. And then um, we have all of these other wonderful uh, northern constellations that are always sort of here. Cassiopeia, the W shape that we had been using a lot during the, uh, the fall and winter, is actually starting to get down low in the northwest. And as the Big Dipper goes higher, Cassiopeia goes lower. And so we always get one or the other of those, but usually not both, uh, unless you have a nice clear horizon. So we're into Big Dipper season now. Farther over into the east, we have our um, springtime constellations. We talked about things like Leo the Lion over here, the uh, bright star Regulus, which is right about on the ecliptic, the plane of our solar system. Um, and so if you're ever trying to figure out where, where the planets move in the sky, there's a path called the ecliptic, and it runs almost right over top of the star Regulus. So that's one of our marker points for that. Up above it is Cancer the Crab, which looks nothing like a crab. Um, it doesn't really look like much of anything, actually, but uh, right in there, there's a beautiful star cluster to look at in binoculars. And then down below, we just have Virgo rising up. Uh, the bright star Spica, just at the horizon here. Here, we'll crank it up a little bit more. There we go. Spica is relatively easy to see. Virgo is a big sprawling kind of shape, but right in about this area is where we have the realm of the galaxies, the Virgo cluster of galaxies. Big binoculars on a dark night or a small telescope will show at least a dozen galaxies scattered throughout an area of sky in here. This is the galaxy cluster that we're all part of. One more spring thing that we'll talk about, the bright star Arcturus really starts to dominate once, it, once things get dark in the evening now. Arcturus is one of the brighter stars in the sky. We've got um, Boates the Herdsman, which looks nothing like a herdsman. And I think last month we talked a little bit about this little semicircle here, Corona Borealis. This is where that recurrent nova, that recurrent exploding star, is expected to go off any time in the next six months or so. It'll be right about there, just down below the little, the little happy face of Corona Borealis, the northern crown. And then right next to that, we already have a summer constellation, Hercules, over here. In fact, I was out uh, with the telescope last night, and about 12.30 or so, I took a picture of the the great Hercules cluster, the globular cluster that's right in about here, one of the showpieces of the sky. And uh, I'll try and get that up on the Facebook page in the next couple of days. It takes a little bit of processing. But uh, we're already looking at summer, summer stars again. Spring just seems to be the shortest season. We have this long winter. We can see Orion for months and months and months. But spring is there for just a little while and then we're already into summer stars and the summer stars include the milky way and lots of bright things so i think we maybe just skip over those those spring stars way over in the west on the other side we still have our last view of the winter stars orion the hunter still visible just setting as things get dark i can see him through the power lines from my house and he's already getting pretty low by the time we get to, um, by the time the sky gets fairly dark. Nearby, Canis Major. This, and you know, when he's, when he's setting like this, it actually does look kind of like a dog with the legs and the, the tail sticking up here and a tiny little head. The brightest star in the sky, Sirius. This is a time to look for Sirius too, because when it's so low like that, the, the Earth's atmosphere, with all of its turbulence and layers and things like that, causes a twinkling effect for all of the stars. It's more pronounced when they're close to the horizon. But with Sirius, Sirius is so bright that we can actually see the colors of those uh, twinkling effects. Because basically, our atmosphere is breaking the star up into images of all the colors of the rainbow that make up the white light, and then spreading them around. So you get beautiful flashes of green and blue and red, and, and then the, the, the brilliant white of the normal color. It really can be beautiful, especially if you're looking right over your neighbor's house and they have, you know, heat coming out of their house because it's not perfectly insulated, that can really accentuate this, uh, this effect. So it really is kind of a nice uh, effect here. Let's see here. Oh, uh, a couple of questions. Let's see. Um, we are going to get to 
to the eclipse in just a minute. Uh, oh, hi, Krishna from Houston. Um, well positioned for the eclipse. And uh, let's see. Um, yes, the email for our activity and for anything that you want to reach me is now in the chat. Melissa points out it could be a spider crab. Oh, for cancer the crab. Yeah, you know, you're right. That It could be... Uh, I was looking for the kind of crab that, you know, you sort of see in, uh, in most places. Um, but yeah, it could be a spider crab or maybe even a horseshoe crab or something like that. Um, Jacqueline asks, is Betelgeuse still dimming? What a great question. So, we've talked about this before. The, uh, the hourglass figure of Orion has two bright stars in it. Down here, this is Rigel. Uh, a blue supergiant star, one of the bigger stars out there. And then this is Betelge Betelgeuse, or Betelgeuse. It is one of the largest stars you will see. It's a red supergiant star, and sometime in the next thousand years or so, it's going to explode. We thought it was going to happen sooner because a couple years ago, Betelgeuse started dimming, and we thought that this might be a sign. We. Astronomers thought this might be a sign that something was about to happen. But then it brightened back up and everything went along normally. So we thought maybe not. Then it started dimming again just recently. Over the last couple of months, Betelgeuse is a little bit dimmer than it has been. And we'll have to see if this continues or maybe these dimmings will be a cycle kind of thing that we can use to, to better predict when it's going to explode. Astronomers of all, um, you know, professional and amateur astronomers are watching Betelgeuse very closely and reporting on its brightness to see exactly what it does, because we, we just don't know. We haven't seen a star this close to us go supernova before, and so we haven't had the chance to see what that star does just before. So this will be really uh, instructive as we, as we watch what's going on. It is a little bit dimmer than normal now, but um, not as dim as it was last year. So it's kind of in the middle there, Jacqueline. Great question. Uh, as always, if you have questions, pop them into the chat there and we will come to them and answer what we can. Let's see. High overhead, I wanted to point out a couple of constellations that you just never hear about. And the reason you never hear about them is because they don't look like much. Um, almost directly overhead and sort of right in front of the, in between the Big Dipper and the Winter constellations, this is the constellation of Lynx. The Lynx. Now, I've seen a Lynx out in the wild before. It's a big cat with gigantic pointy ears and big paws, and it looks kind of like a mountain lion or something, but a little, I don't know, uh, different. But it, it, it certainly does not look like a snake, which is what is depicted here. And it's made up of such faint stars, I've never reliably found this constellation in the sky before. Now, I have to say, I've never had the reason to even go looking for it, so that's part of the problem. But unless you have a dark sky, you won't even see any of these stars. And then over here, this is, uh, this is Camelopardalis, the giraffe. Now, I could have bought this one as being the giraffe, because it's got like at least a long neck, and we could just pretend that the body is over here or something, but this? Come on. Do you know what a giraffe looks like when you're making these constellations? I don't know. Um, and then in here... This is Leo Minor. This is little Leo. Leo the lion up here. Here's Leo Minor, these four little stars. So all of this empty space here actually is made up of constellations. All of the, the entire sky is completely made up and assigned to different constellations, even where there's no connect the dot dots. So that way, everything in the sky is in one of the 88 official constellations. They're kind of like countries or provinces on a map and astronomers sort of use them. Most people don't, though, like the, when we're looking at the stars, we just pay attention to the dot-to-dot -dot figures we can see, but every little star, every little area of the sky is assigned to one constellation or another officially. But nobody really uses constellations very much anymore, other than you and I who go out and try and find our way around the sky. Uh, astronomers are usually using telescopes with such small fields of view and they, they zoom in so much that they just don't care what's around it. They just have the coordinates of their object and that's it. So I think we should take back the constellations and turn them into something that's a little bit more useful for you and I. We'll make up our own, I think, and uh, or maybe go back to some of the other cultural ones from uh, 
from before the ancient Greeks and uh, yeah, let's uh, revolution, let's make our own constellations. Anyway, sorry, it's been a long week. <laughs> okay, um, the sky in April is often cloudy. Uh, you know, April showers bring May flowers, as they say. I don't know if that's going to be true this year because usually December and January we have snow and then March and spring break we have spring and that has not been the pattern at all this year. So who knows what's going to happen weather-wise. But we normally don't have a lot of great observing at this time of the year. So every night is kind of precious. So do try and get out there into the, uh, into the evening. We're already in daylight savings time so the sun is setting quite a bit later than it should um, at least, or our clocks to say it's later. And so it's a little bit harder to stay up later to, to get to a nice dark sky, but it's definitely worth it. And so I hope you get a chance to see, uh, some of the things that we have in the sky, um, for April. And one of those things, of course, is the eclipse. You almost can't go online without hearing about the eclipse. I had a message today somebody was saying that there are there are um, pet groomers that are telling people to keep your pets indoors during the eclipse and close the close the curtains so that the eclipse doesn't hurt your pets and there are literally fake eclipse glasses being sold online all over the place that are super dangerous and will cause eye damage and there's nothing anyone can do about it because no one regulates or controls sort of commerce on the internet and it's just this eclipse has really gone from something I've really been looking forward to, and I'm, I still am, but it's brought all this other baggage with it in terms of um, the silliness that, that occurs around, um, I guess, around any kind of hyped up event. So I hope we have clear skies. I hope those of you that are going to the path of totality have clear skies especially, and I hope we have a wonderful view of it. So we're going to do our last little segment on the eclipse, and then for our next show, which will be the last Thursday in uh, April, I hope to have all sorts of wonderful eclipse pictures and drawings and stories from all of you that we can share during our uh, viewer image section. So putting you on notice, send me your best stuff and, and we'll share it with everybody. This was an image from the eclipse um, in October. We had a partial eclipse here in Manitoba. And the view of the eclipse will probably be similar for us in Manitoba this time. We have a little bit more eclipse happening. It's about 60% instead of 50%, but that's not a huge difference. And so we only have the partial of eclipses here. Hopefully we won't have those clouds. Hopefully we'll have nice clear skies. But to view the eclipse, you have to have safe solar filters. And the problem is, because we've known this eclipse is coming for a long time, the, the, the museums had these glasses in stock for about a year or so. Most places stocked up on them. A few of them sold in October. And now that the hype is hitting, every place that I know of is selling out quickly. If you don't have eclipse glasses in your hands right now, then the museum's gift shop opens at uh, 11 tomorrow morning, but you can go online right now and order them and then they'll be packaged and waiting for you. I don't know of any other sites in the city of Winnipeg or in Manitoba actually that have eclipse glasses anymore. Uh, you might ask your optometrist because some optometrists actually bought a bunch to give out to their patients because of course eye safety, right? Um, so you might check with that. If you, uh, you might check with a welding supply company Number 14 welder's glass. It'll cost you more than a piece, a pair of eclipse glasses. Probably cost you about 25 bucks for a, for a piece of it, something like that. But that is also safe. No other number though. Not number 13, not number 12, only number 14. And I don't imagine there's a lot of that left around either. Do not go online to those mass commerce sites and buy eclipse glasses from a company named something distributing or something international or something. If it's not a telescope store, do not trust it because right now there are literally millions of fake eclipse glasses. I had a, a teacher send me a pair of uh, uh, um, pictures of the ones that they were able to find online uh, about a month ago. And so I tracked that company down and they showed a video 
of what it looked like looking through the glasses, like they held it over their cell phone, and it was way too bright. I, I'm sure they damaged their cell phone making that video, and you would certainly ruin your, your eyes by using them. It's a little disappointing that people would go that far to make a little, you know, to make a few bucks uh, at the risk of somebody's eyesight. Um, but it is definitely a risk out there. So my, my advice at this point is, if you don't have Eclipse glasses, the museum will have some tomorrow. I'm sure will be sold out by the end of day tomorrow. Um, we only had about 1,900 pairs when I went home today. And yesterday we sold 500 in an hour. So like it, they're, they're going like hotcakes. Um, so if you don't get those, visit our webpage, manitobamuseum.ca slash eclipse2024. And there are ways on there to safely observe the eclipse that don't involve eclipse glasses. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit more about them. Um, let's see. Um, okay, we've got a couple of questions here that I'm going to come back to after our eclipse segment. F Phil says, but Timu is so cheap. Yeah, between Timu and Alibaba and Amazon, like there, were some, there was a, a company that was selling eclip eclipse glasses for 12 cents a pair. There's no way they could have bought two pieces of properly safe solar filter for 12 cents. I'm sure what they did was they just got those metallic helium balloons and cut up the plastic from that and just mounted them in cardboard. Like it's, it's absolutely ridiculous what's going on in there. Um, oh, that was a joke. Yes, I know. <laughs> um, what can you do for your camera so that it won't be damaged? That's a great question. If you have a phone camera, you can take your Eclipse glasses and hold them over the front of your phone camera, of your, the camera on the front of your phone, and that'll work just well, uh, just fine. I tried that uh, last weekend, works wonderful. And then you can zoom in and you, you know, focus with your camera and, uh, and get a great shot of the Eclipse. If you have a DSLR camera or a mirrorless camera, one of the bigger ones, you need a filter that would go over the front of a lens. Um, and it's, I don't know if it's impossible to get one at this point, but you'd have to call a telescope supply place. Um, there are a few places that I work with regularly. There's, uh, let's see, there's David Astro in Montreal or in Quebec. Um, there's Ontario telescopes and telescopes Canada are in Ontario. There's all star telescopes in Edmonton. Um, you might be able to get a solar filter from them. Um, and some of them may actually still have some eclipse glasses, who knows. Um, but uh, again, don't go and try and get something off, off the internet from someone you don't know at this point, because it's, it's really not worth your eyes. It's better to miss an eclipse, especially a partial eclipse. It's better to miss that than to lose your eyesight. Um, let's see. The other thing is that all of the indirect methods that we're going to talk about, um, are also safe for your camera because basically you're not pointing it at the sun, you're pointing it at an image of the sun. So we'll, uh, we'll talk about that a little bit here. Let's see. Here's the path of totality. Uh, I know a few people that are going down to Mazatlan in, uh, in Mexico. That's got the best weather forecast right now. Oh, my pointer isn't visible. There we go, down over here. Uh, I know some folks that are going to be just on this side of the, uh, of the Texas border. Um, let's see, Krishna, you're down in Houston, so I'm sure you're driving right out, uh, out to the path there somewhere. I'll expect to see some pictures or a story or, or something from you for, uh, for next month. And, um, let's see, then it goes all the way up through, uh, central U.S., right across Indianapolis, uh, and then up into southern Ontario. Now here's the, this is going to be the sad story. Toronto, 99.97% eclipse that's still not a total eclipse. They will see the sky get dark. They will see um, the suns become a very, very thin crescent, and then it will widen, and they won't see the total solar eclipse. And unfortunately, um, for them, they're either going to have to drive way east to, uh, well, almost to Kingston, probably, um, or down around the lake, down into uh, the Niagara Falls area. And um, Niagara Falls is bracing itself. They're expecting 2 million people to show up in Niagara Falls. Uh, and they're used to tourism, but this is going to put a strain on, uh, well, everything. I wouldn't expect to have cell phone service while you're in one of these lar um, large eclipse congregations. I wouldn't expect to have access to uh, 
hotels or things like that unless you've already got them booked. Um, and you definitely want to try and be as, uh, as self-sufficient as you can. It's kind of ironic. We're going a total solar eclipse in a very, um, you know, in, in, in Canada and the United States has pretty good infrastructure. It's not in the middle of a, of a desert somewhere or, or, or in really desolate country. And yet it's still going to strain the infrastructure because there's only a few good places to go. I know the folks in Kingston are expecting maybe upwards of, of uh, several hundred thousand people showing up in Kingston, actually maybe even more than that. All the folks from Ottawa will probably go to Kingston. It's going to be crazy. Um, let's see, someone was saying um, about, uh, oh, Bob, oh, your son is in school in Moncton. Oh, awesome. Um, yeah, uh, so he doesn't have far to drive. The, uh, the, the best weather looks like to be right on the, uh, on the eastern shore of New Brunswick, so up up uh, north of Moncton a little bit, uh, just across from PEI. That's actually got the best weather forecast in Canada, and so it should be a pretty decent spot. Hopefully, he has the opportunity to uh, to see that because, well, you remember you were in you were in school with me when we had that eclipse come through in 1979, and it was uh, <clears throat> so. Um, let's see, uh, Leanne says, are there any cautionary times in Manitoba to avoid being outside if you don't have proper glasses? So here's the thing, the eclipse is no more dangerous than the sun is any other day. There's nothing special about the eclipse that makes it more dangerous. It's just that no one ever thinks to look at the sun any other time. So if you're fine going around your business in the sun on a regular day, then you should be fine during eclipse time unless you don't think you can resist the urge to look at it because you know the eclipse is going on. Um, so you don't have to worry about your pets. You don't have to worry about, uh, you know, your kids or things like that, unless they know that the eclipse is happening and they're looking at it, then there's, there's no problem. Um, I know a lot of schools are, are dealing with it and the school divisions are dealing with it because of, um, uh, the fact that it happens sort of right around school dismissal for some schools. So it's kind of awkward. They're, you know, they're, they'll, they can keep the kids inside, but then they have to send them home while the eclipse is still on. Well, um, so that's a learning opportunity. And I, and I know a lot of teachers are, are, um, doing activities and we have some schools that are bringing their classes down to our event at the, uh, at Assiniboine Park, which we'll talk about in a second. That's where we were for the October eclipse. There was a great shot of, uh, uh, from, I think this is one of Brian's shots, but we've got some Dome at Home listeners in the, uh, in the background there. And, um, hopefully we'll be out there at the leaf without the clouds that we see in this, this particular picture. When you're looking at the sun, you have to wear your eclipse glasses. Uh, if you're traveling to the total eclipse during the total phase, you can take your glasses off and look at the total eclipse of the sun That'll last a matter of minutes, depending on where you are, but definitely, definitely take advantage of that. But then you got to put your eclipse things back on. Uh, I mentioned that we still, we had some, this is an old picture. I don't think we have even this many left, but um, you can get those from the museum. Here's the way to deal with it though, because while eclipse glasses are hard to find, cheapo binoculars are not. You can go to any, um, sporting goods store or, um, Canadian tire or any place like that and find yourself a 20 or $30 pair of cheapo binoculars. And then you build a special device made out of cardboard. Um, here I just used white paper, but actually it's better if you use a little bit thicker cardboard, you just trace out the, the two apertures, the two lenses of your binoculars onto the piece of paper and you cut them out. So that basically you make yourself a little shield that fits over the front of your binoculars. So both lenses go through here and then you cover up one of those lenses with its lens cap. So basically you've got a nice shield here and then you've got one lens, which is like a little telescope that will point towards the sun. Now you do not look through that lens at the sun. You will flash boil your eye. You, just, you don't want to do that. But what you do is you hold it up, you put your back to the sun and you hold up the binoculars so that the, the one open lens is pointing towards the sun and the sunlight goes through the thing and then focuses on another piece of paper that you put there. And what you do is you move it back and forth until you get a reasonable size image of the sun. And then you adjust the binoculars focus until the edges are solid. And that's an image of the sun. 
Now, it doesn't look like much because on the day that I shot this demonstration, there were no sunspots and there was no eclipse going on. So it just looks like a circle, but that's actually an image of the sun. And if you did it now, you would see all those sunspots that we saw in those other pictures. And during the eclipse, you will see a dark, a dark circle of the moon blocking out more and more of the, the thing. This isn't the kind of thing you want to do with thousand dollar binoculars. The, the heat from the sun going through the binoculars does build up in there and it might affect the coatings of them. It might, some of them that might be glued together, the glue might loosen up. I wouldn't do these with binoculars that I paid a lot of money for. Um, in fact, I would suggest buying a pair just for this. And then if they don't survive the encounter, that's okay. You just throw them away. Um, I would also only do this for a minute or so at a time and then point them away so that they can cool down a little bit so that the heat doesn't build up too much. But you're never getting the heat concentrated in one tiny little spot because of the, of the fact that you're projecting over this long distance here. This is a totally safe way to observe the eclipse. And it will be, I think, the best way to observe the eclipse because a teacher could be doing this standing here and all the students could be around on the sides all seeing it at the same time. You don't have to wait to look through and you don't have to hand around eclipse glasses or whatever. This is a really great way of, of viewing the eclipse. We'll be doing this at the leaf, but we'll also um, have telescopes and other things there uh, as well. So if you don't have eclipse glasses and you can't get them, the plans for this are on our Manitoba Museum's Eclipse website, Eclipse 2024. So just go there. There's a PDF handout that you can download at the bottom that shows you how to build this. Uh, highly, highly recommended. Uh, let's see. There was a couple of other questions here. Um, let's see. Um, oh, Melissa was talking about um, using the, the North Star to find your way around... Um, without the, uh, without power. Um, yeah, we still teach celestial navigation using the North Star to air cadets, uh, despite the fact that, you know, they are flying in GPS aircraft and stuff like that. If everything goes down, you never know. So it's always useful to know. Um, Fallon's asking, if the earth was at aphelion and the moon at apogee at the time of a solar eclipse, how would that affect the eclipse? Or would that not happen because of their orbits? That's a super cool question. Um, so it, it, that absolutely does affect the eclipse. So you've got the, the sun and you've got the earth and then you've got the moon and the sun and the, or pardon me, the earth going around the sun, it's not a perfect circle. Sometimes we're a little closer, sometimes we're a little farther. That means the sun looks a little bigger or a little smaller depending on where we are in our orbit. That affects what an eclipse looks like. And the same thing with the moon. When the moon is a little closer to us, the dreaded super moon thing that you, uh, you know that I love. Um, the moon looks a little bit bigger, barely a little bit bigger though. Um, and when the moon is at its farthest point from us, it looks a little bit smaller. So all of that, the sun and moon changing their sizes totally affects what's going on with the eclipse. In the worst case, you get a big sun and a small moon. And when they go across, the moon's not big enough to cover the whole sun. And you get what we saw in October, an annular or a ring eclipse, where even when the moon is right across the middle, there's still a ring of sunlight around it. And uh, so they call it the ring of fire. And I mean, that's a cool kind of thing, but you don't get to see the corona and all the glorious total solar eclipse stuff. And then the best situation is when the moon is biggest and the sun's at its smallest, because that means that the sun is blocked out for a long period of time. And your eclipse duration can be up to, I think it's almost eight minutes. Now, the one we have here uh, next week, is, I think the duration is four and a half minutes at the maximum down in Mexico. Um, so we're kind of in the middle there. We're, we're, the things are good enough for a total eclipse, but we only get four and a half minutes of totality rather than up to eight minutes. So great question. And yeah, that absolutely affects every single eclipse. That's That's why every eclipse has some differing uh, things to it, and it's not just the same thing over and over again. Uh, let's see. Uh, Kevin McGregor says, RESC might still have some glasses. Yes, so the Astronomy Club, um, both here in Winnipeg and the National Astronomy Club, m made a whole bunch of eclipse glasses, and there may be some available. There might even be some floating around at the eclipse event on the 8th. Uh, I wouldn't count on it, but it's possible. So that might be a thing uh, that you can do. If you wanted to check out the local or the uh, the national site, 
Uh, I put the link in the website there. They might still have some and they might be able to ship them from Toronto in time for you to get them uh, to see the eclipse. So that's another, another option there. Uh, Chris, Chris is saying um, meteorologists are already predicting clouds and rain over hill country. Lots of people, millions will be disappointed. Yeah, the, uh, the, you know, the 10 day forecast or whatever it is now doesn't look great for some areas, but well, Jay Anderson, who's a, a meteorologist here in Winnipeg, who, who is like the world leading eclipse meteorologist, um, is, is sort of of the opinion that, you know, the, the forecasts are only good until the day and then what you get is what you get. So you can use the forecast to guide yourself, but things can always change, especially this far out. So hopefully people will get a chance to see it. And luckily there's enough places doing live streams that will at least be able to live stream totality from somewhere. It's going to be clear somewhere, right? Uh, Dale points out Bill Shatner is going to be at the U of Indiana. That's hilarious. Um, yeah, Bill Nye is doing a thing too. Um, I forget where he's going to be. Uh, I think he's in Texas down, down that way. Um, yeah, Shatner is, uh, he's a character, but, um, yeah, any, anybody that's doing space stuff is definitely wanting to see this. This is the last total eclipse from sort of the most accessible parts of, uh, North America for quite a few years. Um, there's some that are up high North. And there are some that are down, you know, quite far south, but we have a, we have a number of years before the next one, uh, 2044, there's one that goes through North Dakota and Montana. So, I mean, that's, that's kind of a little ways in the future, but I know that there are a lot of people, um, that are, you know, counting on this one to see, but there are, there's an eclipse usually every year, somewhere in the world. If you're able and willing to travel, you can definitely check out that. Um, let's see, Michelle asked, do I know if anywhere in Winnipeg has a filter for a camera? There's not a lot of places in Winnipeg that carry, uh, specific telescope stuff. Um, you might try, um, I, I got a piece of welding glass, number 14 welders glass, and I literally duct taped it onto an, uh, a lens, uh, shroud and put it onto my camera. And I used that last time. That's probably your, your best bet at this point. Um, unless you mail order something from one of those telescope places. Um, there, there, uh, there isn't any other place in town that sort of carries that kind of gear. Now, having said that, I haven't called all the camera places. Um, maybe some of them saw this coming and, and stocked up as well. So you could try like, um, you know, any of the, the bigger camera places you might be able to, uh, like Don's photo or something like that might, uh, might have something. Uh, okay. Let's go here. This is the leaf. It's really a spectacular building. And out in front of it is the community garden, which is where we will be set up to view the eclipse. It's a free public event. We will have the same solar telescopes that, uh, I was talking about earlier, plus a whole bunch more. And we will have, um, you know, the, uh, a projector there. And we'll also have a live stream so that even if it's cloudy from where we are, we'll be able to watch the eclipse from different locations. And right now I've got it scheduled so that we have, uh, five different feeds from places that will experience totality. And, uh, I have two more, excuse me, that I'm working on. So like I say, one of those places is going to be clear and we're going to see it. Um, and even the October one, it wasn't terrible. We did get to see it through the clouds. We did at least get to see the eclipse. So that was nice. Uh, but I am hoping for better weather. That's going to be, um, down at the, uh, the leaf, it starts at 1230 on Monday, April the 8th, 2024. And then you can, um, you can stick around till about three when the eclipse ends. The maximum eclipse for Winnipeg is about two o'clock, uh, central time. And, uh, if you are farther north or west, the times change only by a few minutes, but you see less and less of the sun covered up, uh, folks in the sort of northwestern part of the province we'll see, you know, 50%, 45% of the sun covered. Uh, not a huge difference, quite frankly. Uh, so it'll be great. Um, oh yeah. The, yeah. So I uh, covered that. Um, Marge says, oh yeah, the, uh, the, uh, number 14 welders glass. Yeah. Well, I bought that piece. Um, it doesn't come in any kind of mounting. So I put duct tape around the edges just so I wouldn't, you know, break it or something like that, just as a, like a little handle. And it's wonderful to look at the eclipse with it's nice and solid. And you feel like you feel like 
you're being protected. It's, it's designed for this kind of stuff. So yeah, if you get welder's glass, definitely, definitely worth it. Okay. Let's see. I think, let me check here. I think it is time for I mean, I know it's all Eclipse all the time, but we can't miss talking about some of the cool space stuff from the last month. Uh, I don't know if you watched the Starship flight test number three. It was pretty spectacular, I have to say. I mean, it's a big rocket. It took off. It did its whole separation thing, and the booster flipped around and came back, and it was going to land in the ocean. They weren't planning to recover it, but they were going to try and land softly anyway just to test. And that went probably 95% to plan, and then at the end it sort of lost it and and crashed. Um, and then the, st the Starship itself went up to um, the altitude it was supposed to, uh, the into, into real space, you know, past that 100 kilometers altitude, spent a, a little bit of time up in there and basically then came back down. And the big surprise for me was the amazing video that they got all the way through the flight. I've never seen video of a spacecraft re-entering like this. I mean, there's been some, um, uh, there's been some that you can, uh, see a little bit, but this has really, really been spectacular. Um, the, the, the whole plasma heating and things like that, it was a beautiful thing to watch until it burned up because it was tumbling and it was sometimes the heat shield was on the wrong side. It was, it was completely out of control on the way down. So it was not a great test from that perspective, but it made for some pretty good video. Um, they're already getting ready to launch number four. We'll have to see how all of that goes, but that was a pretty spectacular, um, uh, view certainly. And it was, uh, I mean, it wasn't unexpected that, not everything worked, and apparently they're now changing the way they launch completely um, for view num for launch number four. They're changing the launch pad, and they're changing a whole bunch of things, because why get good at something when you can just try something new? It, I don't fully understand their methodology, um, but like I say, if we get some nice pictures like this again, and if they keep making progress, then that would be great. But yeah, I just see some chat popping up here in the... Uh, in the, uh, in the chat, um, about looking at a, a floppy disk and the, the contents of a floppy disk and stuff like that. It, so it turns out that there are a number of materials that dim the visible light, um, quite a bit. I've heard of people using floppy disks. I've heard of people using old black and white exposed film or DVDs or things like that. They block the visible light, but they do not block the infrared and the ultraviolet light. And that's the stuff that does damage to the eyes. And the worst thing is, because there's no pain sensors in your eyes, you can't feel it. When you're, when you're, uh, this is, it's the same with like really dark sunglasses, actually. If you uh, are looking at the sun, you're, the, the image is dimmer, so your eye opens up more, and it allows more of the infrared and ultraviolet to come through to your eye and to cause permanent damage. So I would not use um, that for a... I, I, I mean, it probably wouldn't do damage if you tried it once and it's like, oh yeah, that's cool. But if you did it repeatedly over the course of a couple of hours looking at an eclipse, I'm sure you would damage your eyes. I would, I would definitely uh, avoid that. Um, okay, here's a picture that um, a friend of mine, Judy Anderson, sent, uh, sent to the Astronomy Club's Facebook group. It's a, a study on satellites. And this is sort of the situation of the world right now with the number of satellites that are up there. And each one is represented at a point that I believe represents its, its closest point to the Earth, rather than having a line, which is kind of, it makes it look worse than it is because the satellite is not all along that line. It's only in one point. So this is one point per satellite. Um, in the next 10 years, with the plans of, um, there's not just Starlink anymore, but there are four different companies all planning to launch tens of thousands of satellites to provide internet. This is what the um, comparable diagram is in 10 years. That's terrible. Um, now, there are some, there is some work being done um, in trying to make these as 
unobtrusive as possible. And I certainly don't begrudge the idea of people using Starlink or something like that to get internet. I mean, if you're in the middle of nowhere, or even if you're in a, just a place that isn't serviced by high-speed internet, satellite internet is a, a lifeline. I mean, you, you have to have internet in, in today's day and age. And this is the kind of thing that will also make it available in, in countries that don't have the, the infrastructure for fiber or things like that. So I totally get all that. I just wish there was a way to do it that didn't involve a bazillion little satellites flying around the sky all the time. It'd be better if there were like a few big ones or I don't know. I just wish there was a different way because this looks really bad in terms of astronomy. Um, and it's gotten better than it was for a while. The first Starlink satellites, for example, the first ones that were, that were up there were bright enough that they were as bright as the Big Dipper. So imagine there are 6,000 stars visible to the unaided eye and 15,000 Starlink satellites that are just as bright that are all moving around. Like, how would you ever find a constellation? It'd just be this swirling mass of, of dots. Now, it's gotten better. Starlink, uh, uh, SpaceX has responded to those concerns and made their spacecraft less bright and they, they deal with their uh, operations a little bit differently so that they, they aren't as as bright. They're actually harder to see now. I remember that we were out at um, Assiniboine Park that time with a few of the Dome at Home folks and uh, Fallon, you spotted the Starlink train coming over and it was, it was beautiful. Um, I've tried to see one since then and they're a lot harder to spot. You have to have really, really good um, conditions to spot them because they're just not as bright as they used to be. So that's good. Um, and Ben points out, yeah, the satellites keep needing to be replenished because they re-enter and you need new ones. So it's not a great sustainable model, unfortunately, but it's a first step to getting internet everywhere. And hopefully we'll get to a point where better methods will come along that we won't have to keep replenishing all of those and they will eventually um, come in and it won't be like that thing, uh, that movie WALL-E where they have to like fly through the cloud of space junk and things like that. Um, one more thing, the Boeing Starliner has its maiden flight scheduled for May the 1st. It will carry two astronauts on a test flight to the International Space Station. This has been waiting a long time. Um, they had a flight back in 2019 that didn't go so well and did some work on it. And while they were doing some work, they discovered some other things. And then it took so long that some of the other components had to be replaced and so on. And so now they're finally flying their first flight May the 1st. If that flight goes well, then Canadian astronaut Josh Kutrick will take the next one, the first operational flight, up to the space station sometime later in the year for his six-month tour of duty in space. So we're following this one very quickly. I've resisted making any kind of doorway or hatch joke or anything like that. Um, when, when one door closes, another door opens. Um, anyway, we... Uh, we really hope that the Starliner will be a great ship and will be yet another way of getting to astronauts into space. So we're looking forward to that. Um, let's see. Um, Dale points out, uh, yeah, we need to clean the thousands of dead satellites. Well, luckily, they do re-enter eventually. Unfortunately, some of them can stay up there for way longer than they should. It should be a law that you're not allowed to have a spaceship up there that you can't have re-enter. You can't control it to re-enter and you should not wait for it to die. You should wait until it's sort of run its course and then voluntarily re-enter it so it burns up and lands in the ocean or something like that. But there is nobody governing space. You can do whatever you want and unfortunately some people are. So that's, that's the problem with this point in our history. We're just understanding that space is a real place and it's not just a place that we might send a rocket or a flag once or twice. It's part of the universe we live in and we need to be able to have rules that will apply to it for the way that we work with it. So that is something that is, um, that is something that will come. Hopefully it will come before you know bad things happen. But the way humanity tends to go is we we do things as easily as we can until the problems, the side effects build up and then we deal with those side effects and then we slowly learn our lesson. And eventually, I, you know, I have faith that, you know, humans can solve a lot of things and we just have to 
put our mind to it and do it. So I'm confident that we will get past this sort of teething problems of integrating space and uh, life here on Earth. Um, Melissa suggests uh, geosynchronous. Um, yeah, I mean, that's the way to do it, but you would need more powerful spacecraft or more powerful transmitters and stuff like that, and so therefore that would cost more, so this is the cheap way to do it. Um, yeah. It, it'll be interesting to see, certainly. But I, like I say, I, I do have faith that we will solve these problems, maybe at the last minute, maybe, you know, in a bit of a crisis situation, but we will, and then we'll continue on. And, I mean, we've gone from being trapped here on the ground, walking around, to being able to fly to the moon and sending spacecraft to the outer planets in, you know, a hundred years. What are we going to do in the next hundred years? With all that internet that everybody has, you know? So anyway, lots of cool things. We're, oh, we're out of time for tonight, but uh, a couple of quick things. Uh, reminder, April the 8th, solar eclipse. Don't miss it. Come on, join us at the at uh, Cinnaboyne Park if you can get the day off. Um, and, uh, or, or tune in. We'll be uh, doing a live stream here for, um, for uh, the event. So you'll be able to see, um, at least join us virtually that way. Um, also, if you uh, are able to send us any of your astronomical images, definitely send them in. I'd like to see that. Uh, oh, Kevin points out, yeah, latency for internet at, at uh, the distance of geosynchronous orbit. Yeah, that is a, that is a problem. We'll have to figure out. Uh, we gotta, we got to put our heads together. We'll, we'll figure this out. Um, let me see. Uh, the next show that we'll be doing is the live eclipse show on the, uh, on the 8th. So join us for that. And let's see. I didn't even talk about the new spring break planetarium shows that we opened. There's a whole bunch of things going on at the planetarium. And we will be doing some uh, live telescope stuff, uh, hopefully this evening, uh, on my Scott the Skywatcher page. It looks like it's still clear and my gear is still set up. So I'm going to uh, go live once it gets dark, which is probably around 9 o'clock. So if you, uh, if you haven't seen that, um, it's a Facebook page called um, Scott the Skywatcher, and you can join us there. Uh, let's see. Oh, a couple more quick questions here. Um, the glasses... The glasses don't expire. Yeah, and that's a good point. Um, thanks, Kevin, for, for jumping in there. Um, yeah, the glasses don't expire. However, if they haven't been um, kept scratch-free, you shouldn't use them. So you take them, hold them up to a nice bright light. You should only be able to see um, a faint view of the light and nothing else. If you can see bright light coming through a pinhole or if there's a scratch or a, a fold in the, in the metal filter of the glasses, then they're not any good uh, because they've been damaged. But yeah, the, the, the coatings don't go bad over time. I'm not sure that I'd use the ones that I found recently in the planetarium's filing cabinet from the 1979 eclipse. I don't know that they'd last for 40 some years, but uh, certainly the ones that you had in October should still be good. Even ones that you had in 2017, if they've been cared for well, I would still think would be okay. All right, everyone. Thanks again. Great to see you guys. Um, uh, let's see. Oh, uh, Marge, you were looking for the full moon show. Yes. Well, join us on the 8th and join us tonight at uh, about 9 o'clock and we'll do some live streams and uh, I'll show you the moon then. Thanks, everybody. Have a great night and we will see you on Eclipse Day. Good night. <laughs>